This may look familiar to some of you. And it's not so much what's on the screen, but I mean, it looks kind of familiar, right? You know, that distinct, smooth VHS kind of look. These 20 to 30 year old cameras shot that footage. I used them recently to get these takes, and they surprisingly still work. I shot most of these, except this clip from 1993. <laughs> Let's focus in on the nose. Okay, we're looking up the nostrils. Thanks, John. Like most of us, much of my life early on in the content I consumed was captured on VHS tapes. What about these cameras over here? While this footage was shot on an 80s camcorder, these movie cameras are as old as dirt. For years, I've wondered what people made movies on before tape came along. Moving images have been a long fascination of mine. But it wasn't until my dad showed me his own home movies from the 50s did I want to learn more. It's not a nostalgia thing for me, but more fascination of the technology itself and the context surrounding it. Think about it. What is or isn't captured has all to do with not only the analog restrictions, but the inherent biases we have when filming. When did average people start making movies? And how did they do it? There have been several movie film formats that have come and gone in the last hundred plus years, but I just want to focus on the main ones that we still use today. There's 35mm, 16mm, Super 8, the easiest to use, and 8mm. The oldest of the bunch is 35mm, which really is the golden standard for full length feature filmmaking. It has a large image area, so the picture is quite sharp. The larger the image, the sharper the picture. It never really caught on in the home movie market for the average consumer. The equipment and the film was just too expensive. So in the 20s, the demand was finally met for Eastman Kodak's 16mm film. A smaller film format. The footage can be quite sharp, and it's really cool to breathe life back into some of these old dinosaurs. It was initially geared towards consumers, but it proved to be a little bit out of reach economically for most people. The whole movie was still considered a luxury in the 20s. This right here is the first gear-driven 16mm camera, first appearing in 1923, the Bell & Howell Filmo 70A. No batteries necessary. Just turn the keywind counterclockwise, pull the trigger, and you're golden. It, it sounds like a blender, I know. The design was so successful that it actually functioned similarly to the later Bell & Howell models. It's built like a tank, and it was often used by the news gathering crews, and of course, uh, film propaganda reels. There's actually a catch with all this. These cameras can only record 3 minutes at a time on a 100 foot spool, if we're filming at the standard 24 pictures a second. Back then though, the filming speed for consumers was 16 to 18 pictures a second making for some pretty choppy footage, but giving you an extra minute or two of footage. The faster the pictures, the smoother the movement. And another thing. Since there are no batteries, you have to wind the camera. A lot. This can usually go for about 20 to 30 seconds on a full wind. This will give you one hell of a wrist. It also makes you wonder about how people considered what to film. People made it work, and we can see it today. Speaking of which, how would we do it? There are countless projector models for 16mm, Super 8, and 8mm available. And I know I haven't mentioned the other two formats much, but most of this information carries over. 8mm is like 16mm, but even smaller, and by far the most popular home movie format of the 50s. It actually came out in response to 16mm being too expensive. It came out in 1932 with the Kodak 8 Model 20. I have yet to film with this guy. And later on in 1965, Super 8 came out. And these cameras take cartridges, most of which take AA batteries. If you want to dip your feet into film, Super 8 is great. It's also in right now. Hipster music videos. The principle of motion pictures is the same as in the camera. 
play the still images quickly, and you have a movie. The film goes through a stop and go mechanism, so our eyes can register the still image before the next one. The spinning blade blocks the light when the film moves, so we only ever see still images playing rapidly. That's what creates the illusion. This projector, it's 8mm, and I got it from a thrift shop for 13 bucks. That's another thing I love about this stuff. If you don't feel like shooting film, you'll probably like watching a real one. You know, that's what they're made for, right? It's just mind-blowing that a lot of this stuff works like nothing, and it goes for peanuts. I personally like to shoot on film because I'm crazy. But watching something like this on a dying medium, it's really unlike anything else. I can't quite say nostalgic because I didn't grow up with it, and I wasn't really familiar with it. But these pieces of history are in my possession. They're tangible time capsules, and I think they serve as a bridge between then and now. It also makes me think, how many other people have used some of these cameras and projectors? The ones that I have. Who owned them and what did they film? I'm sure they have interesting stories of their own.